Here's a look into the importance of timely data and the scientific solutions we need to achieve the SDGs as they mark their fifth anniversary, focusing on three challenges, inequality, health, and climate. Okay, welcome everyone to the SDG Action Zone and this discussion, Data and Action, Factivism Through Timely Data. I'm Alice MacDonald, I'm the Campaigns Director at Project Everyone, which was founded by SDG Advocates and Field Director Richard Curtis to raise awareness of the Sustainable Development Goals, otherwise known as the Global Goals. And this panel came out of a partnership between Project Everyone, the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data and SDSN Trends to put a spotlight on real-time data and the action we need to advance progress. So before we get stuck in and I introduce the panel, I want to just show a short film that Project Everyone made in the last few months with the, with the permission of activist and writer Arundhati Roy to really bring to life the situation we're in and why the goals are so important. So I'll, we'll show the film right now. Whatever it is, coronavirus has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists. And in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world. And ready fight for it. So thanks very much and hopefully that video set the scene for why we're all here today. It really is a portal um, and we have the opportunity now to reset our system, our society, our economies and everything and build a better future. And data and action has a really important part to play. So this panel is about factivism. What does that actually mean? There's lots of definitions. I think my favorite is an approach to campaigning, marrying in information with passion. And I know we have a very passionate panel today and I want to introduce them uh, all. So firstly, we've got Hamzi Lowell, a grassroots campaigner, founder of Follow the Money and CEO of Connected Development, and most recently appointed a Malala education uh, champion uh, from Nigeria. We've got Rosario Diaz Garavito from Peru, founder of the Millennials Movement and a member of the Youth Power Panel. Um, and finally, Claire Melamed, uh, CEO of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. And before we get stuck into uh, discussion, I want to hand over to Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who is president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, a UN SDG advocate and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University to give us some introductory remarks about the importance of data and the launch of SDGs today. So I'll hand over to you, Jeffrey. Alice, uh, thank you very much. It's really uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you to all the panelists and thank you to uh, the partners for enabling us to be part of the SDG Action Zone and to talk about the crucial tools that we have, the, new data tools to help us advance on the sustainable development goals. Uh, I have a passion for real time data because we live in real time. We need information. We need information for management. 
We need information for accountability. We need information for mobilization and campaigning. At the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, we have launched SDGs Today as an initiative for real-time SDG data, harvesting the global networks that bring together uh, amazing information uh, hour to hour, such as on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic or air quality, or now information on CO2 emissions uh, at uh, a daily or weekly uh, basis. Data that used to be available only years after the fact, only on the basis of surveys that were uh, expensive, laborious, and uh, following real events by several years are now available daily because of the world of big data, because of remote sensing, because of satellite information. Uh, we now have the possibility to steer more safely on the planet. And we're going to hear from the panelists how important this is, but I would like to call on everybody to be a partner worldwide on this real-time information. It's a critical tool for knowing what to do, whether it's controlling a pandemic, fighting forest fires, addressing humanitarian crises, uh, watching and stopping illegal uh, uh, deforestation or illegal fishing. These are powerful tools. And wonderfully, they are tools that governments can't shut down because uh, the world watches uh, them uh, through the satellite and scientific information. Uh, and so we can see what's happening on the planet and hold all of us accountable and responsible uh, and a champion building the future we want. So thanks to all the panelists, uh, and uh, I'm sure this is going to be an absolutely scintillating and important discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, and thank you for, for joining us today. So I think we've got some um, great things to dig into for a start. And I want to go first to Claire to ask, so just talked about real-time data. What exactly is the situation? What do we know about where we are on the SDGs? Where are the gaps and what can we do to address them? It's great to be here and thanks to the Action Zone and all the partners who are involved. Um, well, I mean, the first answer to that is that thanks to the SDGs Today platform, we know quite a lot more about the SDGs in real time now than we did uh, a few months ago. Um, but I mean, in general, a lot of the data which governments are using to make those critical policies, which will make, which will make the difference between success and failure on the sustainable development goals, are all too often made with data which is very out of date. Um, surveys, exactly as Jeffrey said, surveys which were done two, three, four years ago. I mean, one of the tragedies of the COVID, uh, epi the COVID pandemic and data is that many countries were just about to embark on a once in 10 year data collection uh, exercise and starting to count all of their populations through the regular national census. But in a lot of countries, that census program has been canceled or at least postponed because of the pandemic. Um, so just as our need for timely data has become more and more acute, and we're seeing how critical it is, some of the ways in which we collect data have been delayed, um, delayed or postponed, or in some cases canceled altogether. I think you know generally the state of affairs when it comes to data and timely data in particular is uh, is pretty bad. But I think thanks to some of the great work that's going on at the moment with activists calling for timely information and as a result of some of the emergency things which governments have done uh, because of COVID, we are seeing now that it's possible at least. So there's no excuse for not doing it. Uh, maybe if I go to Hamzi now, because I think, you know, you've touched on some of the global picture. Hamzi, you've set up an amazing organisation, um, a network in Nigeria, Follow the Money. What is the situation in, in Nigeria and other countries that you work in in terms of the data that's available and what would you like to see happening to, you know, for activists like you to be able to hold leaders to account better? For me, it's about putting a face to this data. So for us at Follow the Money, access to data itself is the ingredient to hold government to account and to inform government decisions and policy. So without data, even we can't run campaigns and 
use it as factors to mobilize young people to use technology tool in holding government to account. So for us, as much as we leverage on data and we also collect data, but we use this data to tell powerful stories and put in faces, put in names to the people that are directly affected by COVID-19 or by healthcare delivery or access to education or even access to water, sanitation and hygiene. And in doing this, we're reducing the numbers of out of school children, we're getting girls back to school and we're showing government that truly when we have data, every single cent of resources would be accounted for. Thanks, Hamzi. And, and Rosario, in, in Peru, I think, you know, you've worked with a lot of young people, and I know that's part of the work that, that Hamzi does as well. How do you see young people using data uh, to support their activism? The use of data, um, well, at least in the Latin American and Caribbean region, is now becoming more um, critical because we have seen that many decisions are being taken. And now with COVID, we, were, we saw that we had structural problems that were the result of decisions that were taken in the past that were not necessarily aligned with the reality and the context of people. So at this moment, whenever we have to respond to the pandemic, whenever we have to plan for the future, then the use of data for young people especially it's, it's very important because that's the way that we can advocate that we are uh, include properly on the responses and the policies that the decision makers are going to take in these critical moments. So in the future, we don't go through these issues. Uh, but definitely, there is more interest on, of young people and also civil society organizations to use hard data in order to back up these social and political speech and demands. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rosario. And I think you've all touched on some interesting examples. And maybe Claire, going back to you, kind of two thoughts is, you know, where the world can seem quite depressing at the moment. Where are we seeing good examples of where governments or other organisations are really investing in the data? And also, where are we seeing gaps? It always feels to me that there's quite a lot of real time data on climate for different reasons. Where are the real issues where we're really struggling to get information and who is, got, you know, who is leading that we could look to uh, as, as good examples? I mean, I think that one of the things that the COVID pandemic has done has really bring home to governments and others the importance of having timely data and the fact that, you know, knowing what happened five years ago is really not good enough when you're trying to deal with a pandemic, which is happening right now and where the situation is changing every day. So a lot of governments who previously perhaps wouldn't have felt that it was worth the investment are now putting much more energy into uh, into trying to sort of develop the right agreements, make the investments, develop the relationships that will enable them to take advantage of what already exists um, for timely data. And I think we're seeing, uh, we at the Global Partnership work with governments um, and with the United Nations, particularly across, across Africa. Um, and we've seen, you know, there are more than 20 governments now that we're working with, uh, working with the statistical offices and other parts of government, really to invest in, putting together different data sources. And that's one of the really magical things here that we're used to a world perhaps where we kind of look at data one at a time. So we look at the results of a survey and then, you know, five, you know, next day we look at the, look at what a satellite image is telling us. But what we're able to do now is put those things together. And that's what gives us the really sort of 3D picture of the world and allows us to keep monitoring changes and understanding how the world is changing every day and it gives the governments the information that they need to fight the pandemic you know where are the populations that are the most at risk what is the where are the people who have diabetes or the people who have respiratory illnesses who are most at risk what's happening with children out of school in particular areas what's happening to the economy every day you know can we track activity on credit cards or mobile money to give us an understanding of what's happening to the economy every day so governments can track what's happening and whether they when they need to intervene and also whether the things that they're doing are working all governments are flying blind now and trying new things that perhaps they've never done before and they need to know what impact they're having very quickly so I think all governments are much more um, aware of the importance of timely data and are doing what they can, and of course capacities vary enormously in terms of resources, in terms of skills, 
and other things um, to knowing what to do about it. But we're seeing a kind of interest and excitement about the possibilities in a way that I think at least at the Global Partnership, we've really never seen before. I know just uh, and to go back to you, Rosario, I know you were going to come in on that point as well, and then I'll go to Hansi. Oh, definitely. Um, thank you very much. Um, so yes, in the Latin American and the Caribbean region, we have seen different examples. For instance, the UN Economic Commission for the Latin American and the Caribbean region, and also the working, uh, do, uh, working group on youth of the UN in the region, they have been um, the, uh, facilitating surveys and collecting information on on how the COVID-19 is affecting young people so they can properly respond and, and provide um, a technical support to the, to the governments in the region, to the member states. Uh, in our case, we were able also to uh, kind of uh, launch a campaign. Uh, it's called Young People Facing COVID-19. Uh, and we were able to um, research on different UN reports and current UN reports uh, and link that information with hard data uh, about young people in the region to see how COVID-19 is actually affecting young people and why there is a need for young people to be uh to be also include on these responses so basically uh this this was a four months project that allowed us to not only identify um information that was lacking but also to create a new way of um format whenever young people start demanding action you know in order for them to see what what is the context and how they can frame better their demands mm -hmm. Thanks, Rosario. Maybe Hamzi, I think it's an interesting point about particularly with young people. We're seeing young people around the world, so much activism going on. Where do you think young people are looking to for their sources of information and, and facts? And to your point earlier, how do you turn kind of really technical facts that can be quite confusing into something that resonates with, with the public, particularly young people? Uh, for us, uh, as young people, one thing we leverage on is also to use tools where we can translate this data into visualization or infographics, uh, or in an illustration where you have cartoon that tells young people the meaning of this data. And for us, data have now have you know the data have allowed us to organize more, uh, uh, to mobilize more, but also to take action. And and in rebuilding back post COVID nineteen, data plays a critical role. One, it helps us show us where investment is going, uh, where we're lacking investment and where we need to mobilize for more action, both at private sector, government, civil society, and other campaigners and activists from around the world. Thanks, Hamzi. Maybe just pick up on that while, I'm, while you're, you're speaking. So I think um, this week and, and during UNGA, there's been a focus on some real big cross-cutting challenges, so poverty and inequality, gender discrimination, climate, justice and human rights are there you know within that or other issues are there particular areas where you see a real gap in your country or globally where either we need more data or we need more kind of campaigning what, what do you see as the big the big issues that if we're going to achieve the SDGs we really need to be focusing on all together in the, the decade ahead but hopefully in the next six months rather than just a decade well, for me it's education access to timely and quality education are we investing in infrastructure? Are we building school? Are we providing teaching aid? Are we also investing in human capital development? Are our teachers equipped with the up-to-date knowledge and skill to, trans to transfer this knowledge into younger people? Are we also working to reduce early child marriage? COVID-19 has shown that in Nigeria, we have over 10 million out of school. Over 2 million might join this number if we don't take action. We're also seeing that you know, there's been a spike on gender-based violence and child molestation. So again, it's about ensuring that this data help us rebuild public trust because we need public support to achieve the decade of action and to rebuild back. And for us to reduce inequality and ensure that children go to school, we must be able to invest and put our mouth where our money, put our money rather where our mouth is using data. Thanks, and, and, and Rosario, the same question to you in Peru, what are you seeing as the main issues that there are gaps in or opportunities to really push forward on? Um, well, definitely uh, capacity building on the on the technical skills that uh, the government representatives, university and people need in order to start, you know, collecting data and understanding data. 
uh, it's uh, it's also important to understand that uh, in countries where, for instance, we are not investing much on science, we are not investing much on creating or or, or in policies that push, you know, uh, the technical or to include technical knowledge or uh, like this on the curriculums and and also uh, that provide support to institutions that are generating this data. If we don't have this, what we are going to have is not updated data. And then, you know, the possibility of not respond properly to the people challenges. So definitely that will be one. The other uh, would be also the understanding of this data, how we invest not only uh, with technical tools, but how do we make the data um, more like a common language for people? How do we start, you know, investing on uh, explaining people how to read the data, how to understand the data, so they can also uh, take that information whenever they have to run different activities in their communities. Um, and definitely, I think one of the main things is, uh, uh, as was mentioned before, the infrastructure. How do we create the, the this uh, with, with the tools that we have now with ITs, uh, an infrastructure that allow us to collect permanently data, you know, so is not there, so we don't have these, you know, um, exercises each five or ten years, and then we have this gap in between without knowing what is going on in the, in that moment. So building this infrastructure is great. Uh, in Peru, we have an example. Uh, the government has uh, this. Uh, platform called Sawire, and we can actually know how many yeah, how many people uh, has born in Peru uh, after one hour uh, after they are born. So, and that is quite amazing, and I think that needs to be reinforced. Yeah, and that's that's amazing. I didn't know that. Within an hour is incredible, and, and it probably goes to a question I had for Claire, which is obviously the SDGs are a universal agenda. And in the same way that the, the debate about data, I mean, you, you work with a lot of different governments, like, are you seeing some similarities and challenges and opportunities between, you know, higher income countries and lower and middle income countries? And what are some of the lessons we could we could draw on from, from that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that this agenda of new data sources and new technologies and the possibilities of timely data is kind of new to all governments, you know, using some of these new data sources and the, the tools that Rosario was just talking about um, to give governments the data that they need hour by hour is something that nobody was doing 10 years ago. So all governments are, are learning. Of course, some have a better digit, a better infrastructure of cables and Wi-Fi and others have more capacity in terms of people who are trained in data science and so on. But the common challenge, you know, I always think these challenges are always much more human than technical we tend to focus on the technical challenges and you know do we can we code but actually really the challenges are political and human all too often and you know in getting governments to want to use timely data sources and to understand the benefits that they can bring and doing so in a way which people can trust which can protect people's rights and not undermine some of the very hard-won freedoms on which the sdgs are based so I think that really the, the common challenge, we, we tend to often focus very much on the, the, the gaps between countries and they are real and we shouldn't underestimate that, but the common challenges here are really challenges of a common humanity around relationships and politics and you know, working together to solve some, some big challenges. So um, I think you know, certainly many of the governments that we work with from all around the world are facing these common challenges of trying to make technology useful. Technology is there and we all get very excited about it, but making it actually serve us and serve the SDGs is a human challenge and not a technical one. I think Hamzi, I know you use a lot of technology. Do you feel technology is serving the purposes of factivism or do you feel there's a lot of you know talk about misinformation online? Like what's your view on how technology can be a force for good uh, for campaigners, uh, not a barrier? Oh, technology is, 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 is for us, it's, it's a unique tool. And I, I always say it's a blessing to my generation. When COVID-19, the After Effects Index case, and when government was committing uh, millions of dollars, when we launched the hashtag follow COVID-19 money, you know, and 
enforcing social distance and the lockdown. It was technology too that we use in tracking this money we've been disposed for palliative for stimulus pack and getting feedback from people who have access to stimulus pack both from and organized private sector. So so yes, uh, technology have helped us reinforce our campaign and have even helped United us with now collecting data from over nine countries who are running for local COVID-19 money. Interestingly, Pakistan is the new country that have just joined us. So we've seen that technology have helped us organize more and also share knowledge, share experiences and collaborate more where we can counter fake news and misinformation because we also leverage on technology to amplify, uh, to help counter amplify fake news and misinformation and, and equip people who we the right set of data using the existing tool and platform uh, so that you know they can provide feedback that would help government enhance their methodology and responses. Right, and I think there's so many tools with which you can be a factivist. And I suppose my like, well, getting towards the end of the discussion, but Rosario, um, how can people watching this actually be factivists? Like, what, what does that mean to you? And, you know, I think everyone's got a role to play in achieving the SDGs, but what, what would you think people watching could do? Well, I think one of the things that we need to start doing is first uh, start getting uh, to know, start searching what data is available. Because with that, we are going to start understanding where are the little, um, the different, uh, um, let's say, holes or empty spaces where we need to fill up with data or where we need to build data. Uh, I think um, this can be also done with uh, our uh, national governments, but we also have UN reports that, for instance, we want to see and we want to start looking forward. One of our, during our experience, one of the things that surprised us a lot is when we were looking on the proportion of how many young people was living in slums um, in the Latin American and Caribbean region. So they, you know, are, uh, are in safe spaces at least. We realized that even the UN report, the last one, didn't have regional data for, with that information. So whenever we realize about that, we start including that specific um, uh, topic on our campaign. So people will uh, start demanding that governments, you know, uh, start working on data or, you know, partnership with universities or other institutions. So the data is available. So definitely um, being, uh, you know, the, being a activist, <laughs> it's um, not only um, see the data as an external resource, but seeing data as an internal resource that can in help us to improve our quality of life and help and can help us to actually achieve what we are demanding and our human rights. So it's um, action, but you know, information uh, united with action. So it's both together. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And maybe I know it comes to the end. So just maybe Claire and Hansi and just like, you know, a sentence each. What does factorism mean to you? And what's your message to people watching? Maybe Claire first and then Hamzi. I think for me, factorism is using data to bring about change. You know, data is an amazing tool. And I've, we've seen, you know, over the last few years, some of the amazing things that activists can do with data, whether it's about proving that you need a clinic in a in a particular village in northern Kenya, or whether it's about revealing the scale of tax avoidance worldwide, um, or demonstrating, you know, more recently in my own country in the UK, the fact that it's ethnic minorities who are dying disproportionately of COVID. And we've seen, you know, all of the many different ways in which data can be a tool to uncover problems and also reveal the solution to and allow activists to fight for the solution to those problems. So I think, you know, the more activists feel confident and comfortable using data and using data to, as a tool to bring about change, the, the better off we would all be. Amazing. And Hamzi, over to you before I tee up the Global Day of Activism, which is tomorrow. Yeah, so for me, factivism is using evidence-based data to bring about attention and bring about results where government can connect what the gaps are and how they can solve this problem. Factivism for me is the answer towards data to connect faces, names of people and location and bring that resources that is needed and inspire the kind of decade of action that we want to see, not only in Nigeria or Africa, but the world at large. 
thank you so much. And if we've got time, I'll come back to you at the end. But I think uh, this, as I said at the beginning, this panel came out of a, a new partnership between our three organisations. And we all have very different focuses. Uh, you know, Claire and the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, SDSN Trends, creating this amazing new tool, SDGs Today, which is the real-time data. And then Project Everyone as a communications organisation, really thinking to Hamzi's first point about how do you turn all that amazing data and information into something accessible. So we really see this as a foundation for the kind of next push towards the SDGs. And tomorrow on the 25th of September, the Global Day of Fact Visit will be taking place on the five year anniversary of the goals. And the idea of that day is really just to put a spotlight on the fact that we need real time data and showcasing some of those uh, new um, bits of information we have. And uh, I'm just gonna pull up on the screen, hopefully. Um, the uh, day of factivism. So uh, a couple of assets that you can see. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, gender equality. We know there's huge gaps in um, available data on, on women and girls. One thing we do know is how many women are in power and it's not enough. It's only 25% uh, and actually it's in the places that are leading the way like Rwanda that you might not expect. So uh, that's kind of one that we want to really show that this is an issue we need to deal with. Um, and then the next one uh, we have been focusing on is climate. And actually tomorrow we'll also see a Fridays for Future strike with young people really doing what we've been talking about, being factivists. And we've got new data that shows how many people are suffering from water stress around the world, 615 million, and we know our temperatures are skyrocketing. So really putting a, a human face on the challenges of a, that our planet is facing. Uh, and then I think lastly, uh, inequality. So um, I know this is an issue that touches everyone. It's universal, but 1% of our population holds nearly half of our wealth. And that is just not right. And we want to put a spotlight on what are the campaigns, whether it's the work that people like Hamzi do to tackle corrup corruption, and to show financial transparency that we can do around that. So those are some of the assets that will be coming tomorrow. Uh, if people want to get involved, they can go to globalgoals.org uh, to find out more. But really, it's not about the day tomorrow, even though we want everyone to take part. It's really about what do we do, as our panellists have said, in the next year to all be factivists and see data as empowering, not something to be afraid of, but something to use uh, to further our campaigns. So I think I want to end it there, but I want to say a massive thank you to our panellists. So Claire, Hamzi, Rosario uh, and Jeff Sachs uh, from earlier for joining us. Um, so please get involved and thank you. Oh.